for this conversation. I'm so excited that you made the time for this. I know everyone is so busy with school, the pandemic, the I election. Know. Yeah, I hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you. Okay, well, why don't we get started? Um, mm -hmm. I should introduce myself. My name is Metadel, and I'm a student um, coordinator for the Center for Justice and Law for this year um, at Hamlin University, and I am a junior. Um, this year's themes are health, justice, um, and the law, and which is why I'm super excited to be talking with Yvonne Hernandez. Um, you inspire me because, I mean, we met through the internship Capital Pathways, um, and through that I, I just kind of got to like get to know you and watch you do the work that you do, and then this summer um, kind of trying to connect um, resources through our community organizing and activism. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I guess, um, do you want to introduce yourself in any way? Yeah. Okay. Well, hi, you all. Thank you for being here. My name is Yvonne Hernandez. I am a junior at Oxford University, first generation college student. I identify as a Chicana and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, let's see. I don't know. Should I say, like, no, I think that's pretty great. <laughs> I, think that we'll, I think we'll get more into like who you are and what you do. Cool. Um, yeah. with my first question, which is, um, what is like some of the work that you're doing within your community during this time? And it can be related to um, uh, the immigration rights um, and the election and health. I mean, they're all connected. Yeah. So as Metadol mentioned, I am an immigration rights activist. Uh, I don't believe in borders because I believe that borders divide um, divide us and divide our people. I believe they create deaths and hate and punish our regular day people. Um, I think that I would argue that, you know, I would push you all to look beyond borders and at, as looking at them as a uh, public safety, but really looking beyond that and recognizing that our country has one of the biggest military forces, right? Um, recognizing that in our own states, we have seen <laughs> um, lots of military on the ground just this past summer, right? So yeah. just really um, pushing you all to look beyond um, border security. Uh, I would say that I've been involved in a few things. One of my most recent ones this summer was being involved with um, Pueblos de Lucha y Esperanza. It's an or organization that's located here in Minnesota, one in North Dakota, and then another one in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And what their focus is, is mainly to remove oppression from immigrants here in the U.S. And one thing that we really focused on was creating protests in the ICE, deten ICE detention centers here in Bloomington, Minnesota. Uh, so that was really a big push for us. Uh, I would say that with everything happening happening in the detention centers due to the pandemic, uh, we have really been trying uh, for for ICE detainees, you know, to be released from those spaces because the and I, I'll get into it a little more yeah. later, but um, yeah, we have seen panda the pandemic really rise in those spaces. So yeah, that's a bit of the work that I've been doing. Uh, some other work that I've done also is being focused on driver's license for all here in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really important that uh, everyone here in our state, even undocumented people, have the right to drive and have a license to be able to provide transportation for their loved ones, whether it's to work, school, or where they need to get to without the fear of having to be deported uh, simply for not having a license. Yes, amen to that. Yes, driver's license for all. It doesn't make any sense um, not to be giving people access to. Right. Because of, people expect people to work, but they don't talk about how they're going to get to their jobs or how yeah. they're going to help yeah. keep their yeah. families like mm -hmm. in school and all the other ways that we we use those um those privileges like it's what it it should be a right but these are privileges at this point they That's are okay. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and I would you know continue to say that yes like we expect for people to get to work without a license but then the fear also of driving without it and then being stopped by 
a state trooper of police, um, you know, and we just have seen so many incidents going on that should not be happening simply for a license. Something that I kind of want to go back and touch on is mm -hmm. um, the pandemic and as it relates to people that are being imprisoned in cages um, and how that's so directly correlated to, to health of, of the people who are um, detained, but also how it also ties into the health of our like nation because there are people that work there and then go in and out. There are um, like attorneys, um, ICE um, agents, um, I mean, all the different people that work in and around the facilities and we're not talking about how that is not helping, you know, bring down the pandemic. Yeah. It's, yeah. I actually wrote down a statistic earlier, but right now we know as of this week, 20% of people detained in Adelanto ICE facility have tested positive for COVID-19 and then 60% of the the detainees in Mesa Verde have also tested positive. So it's not one detention center. It's not in one state. Right. It's in multiple ones. And we are seeing this continue. So, yeah, it's a big problem. Um, it's huge within our health system. And, you know, the bigger issue that if they test positive, what they can do is leave them in the spaces and then others will get affected by that but also they might even deport the person back to their homeland and then the person will carry COVID-19 which continues to create an outbreak in those countries as well so it's just there are so many things to mm -hmm. touch on in that but it's also I think what I um what I keep hearing when we're talking about it is that health is a human rights issue mm -hmm. it's not it can't be predicated or meted out as um based on citizenship and if we don't address that now, what are we what are we saying in terms of who is allowed to have health? Again, I mean, bigger picture, clearly our country really struggles with making health and access to health care a human rights um, yeah. guarantee. But mm -hmm. this is definitely, I feel like, hyper-focused in how much we don't value that. And thank you for like bringing awareness to it. And thank you for talking about it because yeah, it's really important. Of um, I know we've kind of touched on how these things touch, um, are connected to health and justice, um, but can you kind of talk about how immigration um, and voting is tied to, um, to health and, and justice and the, and the law? Yeah. And this election, especially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, with so the pandemic has really been a big one i would say for the health part but i believe that uh another issue that has to do with health is the mental health part of it uh we do know that many people who either migrate to this country um or are coming as refugees uh they are not showing up asking for um tps just because <laughs> they're leaving their countries because of different issues. So a few of the countries that I have focused on is what we call the Northern Triangle, which is Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And we have seen US uh, military down in those countries really focus on the history of bringing military into those countries and then forcing people out of their homes. And so when all of that occurred, gangs began, right, building and trying to support their own people. But then, you know, it became divided between the people, the gangs, and then the government. And so then people are now trying to flee from those places and then have to go through different countries and then arrive here. A few of the people that we see, majority of the people that we see, leaving or fleeing their uh, homes are LGBTQ families. Mm -hmm. They are women and they are young men trying to flee from gangs. And so what we see is trauma, we see anxiety, depression, PTSD, all kinds of mental health issues are happening. And I would say that that is, that's really big. Um, I believe that these countries deserve justice. They deserve for our country to speak up on these issues 
and to recognize the impacts that we've historically done in these places and recognize that they deserve resources to move further, move away from what has happened and then move forward as a way of supporting them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah we, yeah, I think we've, we've done. <laughs> and, you know, the Northern Triangle is only one place. We know about Vietnam historically as well yes. as other countries that are even further and families that have to come from further places as well. I think you're really kind of unpacking and pulling back and, and kind of looking at the root issue, is, which is we're going into countries, we're Foreign messing policy. them up, we're disrupting yeah. everything, making mm -hmm. it 10 times worse, and then getting upset when people are trying to find refuge in this mm -hmm. country. And mm -hmm. not just to find refuge, but to also contribute to the country. So, yeah. <laughs> girl, I'm here. Everything that you said, this is why I was so excited to have you on here, because these are all such important things. And I think you did a really great job of, like, unpacking that for, for mm -hmm. us. Um, okay. Um, what... What has the upcoming election meant for you and your community? Yeah, uh, so I, this past summer, I was involved in the Adriana for Schools campaign. And Adriana Cerrillo is running as a candidate for a school board here okay. in Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, she identifies as Mexican-American. She arrived to the U.S. In, to Florida when she was 12 years old and when she arrived she didn't know English and so there was that barrier between her and the school and one time she still remembers you know if she <laughs> were to come she would explain it all but she remembers when she arrived the teacher told one of the students to translate for her that she had to speak English in order to be in the country and so then Adriana, you know, she, well, she was upset. She said, I don't even want to be in this country. Like, I want to go back home. And so she felt this sort of disconnection from this country. So I, I have felt a lot throughout the campaign work. Um, you know, we've seen hope. We've seen strength. We've seen people fear what is going to happen. I think for me right now, I'm looking at this as a new opportunity and as a hope. Uh, I think that I have a lot of hope for our generation. In the past, we've seen younger generations don't really get as involved in elections and don't really go out to vote. But I think that our generation has truly, like, recognizes the impact that we have and recognizes that we need to show up to these polls. And so I truly have hope that we are going to show up and we're going to make that difference this year. That statistic is going to change. Mm -hmm. I believe we're always around 20 to 30%. Uh, showing up to vote for people between 18 to 23. But I, I really want that to change this year. Um, I have I, I have a strength that, you know, I'm not only going to show up to vote for me, I'm going to show up and vote and represent my family, mm -hmm. my friends, and the people that are around me that are not able to vote. You know, the youth that I work with, the um, undocumented families that I see, my own family, yeah. And so it, it means a lot. <laughs> it's so important. To, to, yes, everything that you just said, the importance of not just voting for yourself, but for everyone around us who can't and just giving voice to them. So that's that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I think one thing that we really are focused on with our um, CJL team this year is not just having these conversations be a one-time thing, but to also be, uh, to also invite other people into, um, into the work that you're doing. How can we best support you and the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to say, I, I just want to encourage everyone to get out there and be involved with local policy. Mm -hmm. I recognize that so much is happening at a national level. Mm -hmm. There is a lot going on, but at least right now for me, I'm kind of sending back and recognizing, you know, the federal administration that we have right now, unfortunately is not the best to work with, but that doesn't mean we stop there. It doesn't mean that we have to sit down and, 
not acknowledge everything that's going on within our own state or maybe our own city, right? So truly, truly get involved um, in local policy, write to your legislators, always write to them, whether it's, you know, something that you're truly passionate about or something small. I remember <clears throat> this um, summer when George Floyd uh, was murdered and the protests were happening. There was a lot of people that were worried about ICE, uh, the yeah. ICE showing up into yeah. the protest. And I was frustrated and, you know, it scared me. And so I instantly emailed uh, Representative Gona Gomez, sorry, and I was like, hey, please check on this. I'm really worried. Yeah. And, you know, if they're not getting back to you, they are all in Twitter. Like, they're in love with Twitter. So yeah. they're pointing them out on Twitter. Like, let them yes. know, I, you represent me. I am your constituent. Like, you're going to listen, and that's what you're there for. So really be outspoken in those spaces. If you are bilingual, please offer your time to organizations. I have been involved with two different ones, and some of them, unfortunately, don't have many resources. And so I would say if you're bilingual, if there's, if you know how to write um, government, you know, documents, yeah, help with that. <laughs> there yeah. is a lot of help. If you can help two to six hours a month, even, I know that it'll be really, um, they'll really appreciate that. Um, can, yeah. Can I, I, can I think... ask you what those two organizations are? Just so, just in case people are really interested in. Yeah. Involved, so like, one of them is um, Pueblos de Esperanza y Lucha. So that's um, the one that I was involved with this summer. And a lot of them really asked me for help in writing to legislators. Okay. Uh, and then the other one is, uh, I forgot the name. I only know the acronym. We always go by the acronym. I would have to look it up. Uh, it's meme. Uh, they're in South Minneapolis, okay. but uh, many of their leads actually predominantly are Latinx and don't speak English, okay. and so they kind of need help with that translation part as well. Okay. <clears throat> wow, that's amazing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's always work to do. <laughs> yeah, that's actually kind of going off of that. How do you kind of plug in? How do you, how did you find out about these resources? Like word of mouth, or is there any like Facebook group or anything that people can join? Yeah, I would say, uh, well, maybe because I do often go protesting, that I just meet people, um, yeah. you know, and just want to connect with others who I see that are really out there. Uh, but I think also once you meet one person, uh, I met Jovita, who works with me, and I let her know about what I was really wanting to work in this summer, mm -hmm. uh, which was <clears throat> the IC detention centers and how they are being affected by our pandemic. And yeah. so then she connected me to um, Pueblos, to Los Pueblos, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Pueblos de Lucha y Esperanza, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so just connecting with different people is also really important. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think, yeah, I think that's really good advice. I think it is hard. Um, during this time to just kind of get connected since so much of it is like um, word of mouth and so much of it is just like your friends telling you about things. Mm -hmm. But I also, I feel like this is a good way. Um, so if like anybody is interested in getting connected, DM me and I will find the resources or the way to connect you. Um, I, my other question is like, um, I think you've kind of answered it in terms of call to action. Um, but is there any particular kind of call to action that we can do in the audience um, when it comes to, especially like ICE uh, detention in re relation to, um, well, generally in relation to the pandemic, um, but also in general, um, because obviously most of us that are probably on this um, live are not, um, are against people being in cages um, mm -hmm. and having their civil liberties stripped mm -hmm. from them. Is there, like, is there, what is something that we can do? Um, I think something that you mentioned was writing letters to our representatives, mm -hmm. which I think is mm -hmm. really important. Yeah, um, education is always going to be really important. So educate yourself and educate others. Uh, I would encourage you to educate others around their rights. So we often see that 
uh, undocumented folks will get pulled over and then don't know their rights or they don't know the language. And so when you teach someone and provide them with those resources, then things are better. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but actually going back to kind of a call to action for you all, uh, Hamlin is such a big school with great opportunities. And another part of immigration that I focus on a lot is uh, focusing on DACA recipients mm -hmm. and how important it is to continue supporting DACA recipients. And so I think that one thing that colleges need to improve on is providing scholarships for DACA recipients. We know that DACA recipients do not receive financial aid from the federal government and sometimes even from the state. So if you are involved in organizations or a leader in your school, write to the president, let them know, you know, it's important to include them into the conversations. It's important for them to get their education as well. But many choose to stop going to school or stop receiving their education because college is super expensive. So yeah, truly focusing on the small things that we can do in our own schools or even in our own city is truly important, right? Writing to our legislators is super important as well. But oftentimes we notice that when only one person is writing, they're not going to listen as often. But when you, when you and other people in your school begin to talk about scholarships or other opportunities um, for recipients, you will see that there will be um, more people listening. And because it's a smaller population, you might receive um, more, more work done. Yeah. Thank you. I really am so glad that you brought that up because like, I really want to dispel the myth that DACA recipients don't have to pay for school. It's something that I keep hearing um, and I'm losing my mind uh, yeah. every single time that I hear it. So thank you for dispelling that myth. And like for once and for all, I don't want to hear it from anybody in my life <laughs> one more time, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's a huge reason why people are dropping it's out. It's huge. It's huge. If you... You know, I, I'm very privileged to have scholarships where I'm at, but, um, you know, I hear of other students who have to pay out of pocket before the semester begins, thousands of dollars. And I just, you know, the privilege that we have does not allow us to see outside of that. So <laughs> yes, yeah. please encourage your schools to do that and encourage, I also with voting, I would encourage all of you to speak to someone around you, let them know to vote. You know, it actually facts and statistics have shown that when you speak to someone directly about voting or encourage them to vote, then they will show up to vote versus no one reminding them. So okay. just show up, let them know, let yeah. your friend know, let your neighbor know, whoever it is. If professors are on here, I don't know, maybe they can provide like two extra credit points, you know, to those yeah. who <laughs> take a picture with their ballot. Um, or yeah. something, you know, it's, yeah. I like yeah, that idea. encourage everyone to vote. Yeah, I like that idea. We want extra credit points and we want to make sure that our <laughs> right? country is going in the right direction. <laughs> um, I think that's really important. I think sometimes we kind of, um, we get a little bit hard on people for posting on social media and uh, as part of their activism. And I think that there's really nothing wrong with that because going back to what you said, education is really, really important and making sure people have the right information is really important. And mm -hmm. on that front, on that, on that note, like making sure that people understand that yes, there is a deadline for applying for an absentee ba ballot, but there's actually no deadline for early voting. Um, well, it's November 2nd, but um, <laughs> But you can show up and you don't have to be registered in order to vote. You yeah, our up. state has that opportunity. Our state is, yes. I'm going to give our state props for that. I'm yes. always getting on Minnesota, but I'm going to give mm -hmm. uh, props for the fact that we can show up and we just need proof of residence in, mm -hmm. in the way of like um, a piece of mail with your name and your address on it um, in order to show up in your in your county um, mm -hmm. voting. Yeah. Place. So, yeah, that's we, we yeah, that's something I'm truly grateful for. I've never voted the day of. I always vote early because personally, I don't like standing in the polls in the winter or that's sorry, the cold weather. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I would encourage you, even if it's not cold this year, try to vote early, get it over with. Yeah, and especially <laughs> with the pandemic. Like, yeah. 
like the, the reason I've never actually voted early. I've always voted day of. But this year, I'm voting early next week. And I'm planning it out because I have to with our crazy schedules. But mm -hmm. I'm voting early next week. Um, and I'm really thankful that we have the opportunity to do that, especially with, you know, COVID-19 kind of still raging, especially in our state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so important. I would even encourage all of you to, even after all of this that's going on, encourage you to continue early voting. Yes. Uh, I've done early voting since I was, since 18. But I've noticed that when you do early voting, you will get tons of phone calls from different candidates asking you tons of questions yeah. because they want you to vote for them because they notice that early voters <laughs> will like majority of the time show up and be there and so they oh, wow. just tend to reach out a lot and it, it has its advantage and disadvantage you know yeah. sometimes um, i don't want to take the call but other times it's so important right because they will ask you to be their delegates they will ask you um you know for if you have connections to certain organizations they will ask for your endorsement but also it goes back to that part of reciprocity like hey remember that time i voted for you as a delegate yes yes so yes. my bill is now up <laughs> what are you gonna do about it so That's yeah amazing. just early voting can have it have its benefits beyond early voting so wow. i'd encourage you all to continue doing that Thank you so much, yeah. Yvonne. Like, you have taught me a lot, and I'm really excited for everyone to be able to, like, listen to you and um, and to plug into all the different things that you've talked about, which we've, we've covered a lot of different things. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking yeah, time. Yeah, of course, and thank you for having me. I'm really happy we were able to reconnect. I know, Summer, you were super <laughs> organized and doing a lot of work, which shout out to you for all of it. And I know that, you know, our schedules didn't align, but I'm just... I'm glad we're going through all of it, so. Me too. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I just want to let everyone know that um, this is our first CJL Spotlight conversation, but we will have them every week um, throughout October. Um, so let's say thank you to Yvonne one more time. I'm just so, so thankful that we got, we, we were able to, to do this yeah. today. Also, oh. thank you for all the love in the, com uh, the comments. I yeah. kind of see the hearts, but I... I'm also I know, to I know. Stay in the conversation. Yeah, so they've thank been going you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then one last shout out. We do have our event on October 30th. Um, and I'm so sorry. I will put the name of the event um, in once I save this and post it on there. I really do apologize. But thank you again, Yvonne. Right. Hope you have yes, a great day. Of course. Much love for you. Take care. Yes, you as well. Bye. Bye.